God, you are good. You are my daddy. You're, You're in charge. charge. Your, Your kingdom, kingdom come. come. I need help. Heal Please. me. Encourage, Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. So do they. Those I love. Those, those I, I don't. don't. This hurting world. Thank you. So why would my prayers matter to God? Why would he care what I think? Why would my voice be heard in heaven? Who am I to have the cheek to think that God would listen to me? I can't even get the cable company to call me back, much less God. Why would my voice matter to him? Somewhere in the discussion of prayer, we have to raise the question, do my prayers matter to God? My goal in the next few minutes is to convince you, yes, 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 a thousand times yes. We're in the middle of a series of lessons called Your Best Ten Minutes because my hunch is if you could just take ten minutes every so often throughout your day and offer a prayer simple like this one to your heavenly Father. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thank you. If you could just let your heart be taken into God's presence wherever you are periodically throughout the day, those minutes would become your best 10 minutes. We're turning the third base uh, in this series because really we've established the first base and that is God is good. We've established the second base and that is that we need help. But now as we round third base, we declare they need help too. People we love need help. People we don't love need help. This hurting world needs help. But before we start talking about that, praying for others, let's just just make sure we can answer this question. Do our prayers matter to God? Does he really hear? Why would he hear? Who are we to make any requests? And why would God listen to us? To help us answer that question, let's revisit two stories in the Old Testament. Probably your favorites, they're mine as well when it comes to prayer. One, the story of Abraham praying for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the other, the story of Moses praying for the Hebrews on Mount Sinai. In the first story, Abraham and Sarah, this patriarchal couple, receive into their camp three visitors. And soon they realize that these three visitors are not just regular visitors. Two of them are angels, and incredibly, one of them is God. And they have come dressed as men. When Abraham realizes who has come into his camp, he throws out the red carpet. He slays a calf. He puts on a feast. He offers to wash their feet. He invites them to rest. And after some time of hospitality, the three guests begin to leave the camp and walk toward the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In very unusual passage, we are given the very thoughts of God. The scripture says that God asked himself, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? No, I won't, he decided. And he turned back to Abraham and he said this, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is very great and their sin is very grave. I will go down now and see. Well, Abraham knew exactly what God would find in Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew the stench of the city. He knew the evil in the streets. The reason he knew is because his nephew had taken his family, Lot had taken his family to live in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he knew, Abraham knew exactly how depraved the conditions and the people of the city were. And he knew that when God saw how evil the city was, that he would destroy the city. And in doing so, destroy part of Abraham's family. So Abraham did something. Verse 22 of Genesis chapter 18 says that Abraham still stood before the Lord. He stood still and he still stood before the Lord. He positioned himself between God and these two cities. He placed himself between the people who needed help, who needed mercy, and the God who could give it. He just stood there. It's almost as if God were right here and the cities were behind him. And Abraham just positioned himself there. 
as if to say, God, I need to talk to you about what you're about to do. Now, this is a gutsy move. Abraham, he's a hero to us, but he was just a Bedouin shepherd, a successful shepherd, but a Bedouin shepherd nonetheless. Hair down to his shoulders, rangy beard. It's well up in years, probably missing a tooth or two. Who is he to question what God is doing? But he did. He stood there like a lone tree on the prairie. And he said this, Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous in the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now, folks, this is the first time anybody has talked to God in this way. In Scripture, if you were beginning in the Bible and starting, you would not have heard Adam and Eve talking to God like this. No one in the city or the, or the Tower of Babel was built. They didn't talk to God like this. Noah didn't talk to God like this. And I'm thinking that Sarah's hiding in a tent saying, you don't talk to God that way, Abraham. You just don't do that. He might nuke us. He might destroy us. But God doesn't destroy Abraham. Just the opposite. He enters into a conversation with Abraham. And it's a fascinating conversation. God says, okay, 50 people. And the righteous are safe. And so Abraham, standing before the Lord, says, good, 50 people. And he turns and he walks away and he stops. I guess he's thinking of the people he knows. <laughs> and Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, hmm, on second thought. 45, 45 will do it. And so he turns and he walks away and he stops again. Hmm, he can't think of 45. So he turns and he goes back and he says, maybe 40. And this back and forth continues until finally they settle on the number 10. And Abraham is at peace. God is at peace. And God turns and the angels and they head toward Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham turns. The two cities are destroyed. But Abraham's family is spared. Because Abraham stood before the Lord. He placed himself in between the people who needed mercy and the God who could give it. Give it. Now Moses did the same thing. You have to fast forward now eight centuries. Moses is on Mount Sinai, the same era that he receives the Ten Commandments. The children of Israel have been liberated from Egyptian bondage. They have just witnessed ten miracles, ten plagues. Uh, they've saw the Red Sea become the red carpet. Uh, they've been liberated for the first generation in four, nearly 400 years to be free. Uh, they should be worshiping God, but instead they have done the audacious deed of, of building a golden calf and they're worshiping a metal cow, a man-made cow. And it's just about more than God can take. And God says to Moses, go down from this mountain because your people, <laughs> he didn't say my people, look up. He says, your people, the people you brought out of the land of Egypt have ruined themselves and they have quickly turned away from the things I have commanded them to do. I have seen these people and I know they are very stubborn so now do not stop me I am so angry with them that I'm going to destroy them and then I will make you and your descendants a great nation would you say that the Hebrews were in trouble I think dry grass on Mount Vesuvius stood a better chance of survival than the children of Israel did the only thing they have going for them is Moses Moses this this octogenarian leader who has a way of talking to God and listening to God. And Moses, if you're ever going to use your clout, now's the time to do it. And so Moses does what Abraham did. He positions himself in between the God who can give mercy and the people who so desperately need it. Listen to the prayer that Moses prayed from Exodus 32. Moses begged the Lord his God. He begged the Lord his God. 
He said, don't let your anger destroy your people whom you brought out of Egypt with your great power and strength. Don't let the people of Egypt say, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt for an evil purpose. He planned to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the earth. Stop being angry. Don't destroy your people. Now look at this. So the Lord, what? Changed his mind. And did not destroy the people as he said he might. The prayer of Moses caused God to change his mind. He changed his mind. The passionate prayer of Moses. In God's face one minute, on his face the next, shaking his fist one minute, pounding the ground the next. It was a passionate, earnest prayer. A prayer in which Moses appealed to God to be God, to be righteous, to be who God said he was. And the prayer was so effective that the scripture says the Lord changed his mind and did not destroy the people as he said he might. Abraham stood before the Lord and as a result his family was spared. Moses stood before the Lord and as a result the nation was spared. And you, you're standing before the Lord. You're standing before the Lord on behalf of someone whom you love that's in the emergency room. God is up here. The one who needs mercy is back behind you. And you're standing out in the parking lot and you're pleading, Lord, please help, help. Please bring healing. Please please bring strength. Or maybe you're a parent and you're praying for your teenager who's gone wayward and you don't know what to say. And so you say, Lord, please Bless my daughter. Bless my son. Awaken them. Quicken them. Chasten them. Do something, Lord. Maybe you're praying for the country. Maybe you're praying for the city. Maybe you're praying for your neighbors or for your family. And every so often, maybe more than every so often, you wonder, do these prayers make any difference? Who am I to speak to God? Will God listen to me? I want to tell you, he does listen to you. And here's the reason. Your prayers matter to God because you matter to God. Period. Your prayers matter to God, not because you're eloquent, not because you know something God doesn't know, not because you've got a secret code that no one else has. Not because you've graduated from an advanced course in prayer. Your prayers matter to God for one reason only. And that is you matter to God. You see, you are his child. You are God's child. The scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called, what? Children of God. When you pray, dear child of God, you do not come as an interloper. You're not a stranger. You're not an outsider. You're not unwelcome. You are God's child. And when God hears your voice, he hears the voice he loves to hear. God loves your voice because you are his child. You moms and dads, you know how this feels. Even the worst dad and the worst mom loves to hear the voice of their kids. We parents will drop everything when we hear our children's voices. How much more would God, who is a perfect father, who is never tired, who's never cranky, how much more would he stop everything when he hears the voice of his child? God loves to hear your prayers because you are his child. But there's more. You're not only his child. You're his ambassador. You have an official title. You have a royal responsibility. The scripture says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. When the country sends out an ambassador to a foreign nation, the job of the ambassador is to represent the president or to represent the king or to represent the sending nation. And when the ambassador speaks, the ambassador speaks in the name 
of the sending nation, with the authority of the sending nation, carrying the imprimatur of the sending nation. When the ambassador speaks, it is as if the king is in that country speaking, right? You are God's ambassador. And when you walk into your schoolroom, you are God's ambassador in that schoolroom. And when you walk through your cul-de-sac, you are God's ambassador. When you walk into your workplace, you are God's ambassador. And Jesus says he is making his appeal through you. You carry the very aroma of Christ. You speak with authority. You proclaim the name of Christ. And when you speak in the name of Christ, all that is evil must leave because that which is evil cannot stand in the presence of the name of Christ. You carry clout. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what your title is. I don't really care what your salary is. That doesn't matter. What matters is you are the ambassador of Christ in your world. So you speak to the world on behalf of Christ. You speak truth. Don't underestimate the wisdom that you have. Because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within you and he speaks through you. So you speak to your world on behalf of Christ. But there's more. The ambassador not only speaks to the world on behalf of the king, the ambassador speaks to the king on behalf of the world. Right? Does the ambassador not call back to the palace or to the White House and say, we need help down here. We need resources out here. Or there's trouble out here on this foreign outpost. We need you to help. And what will the king do? What will the president do? Well, hopefully they will respond. Why? Because that's what they sent the ambassador to do. It's the silent ambassador that troubles the king. It's the mute ambassador that troubles the president. We haven't heard from him in forever. What's going on out there? God wants to hear from you. And when you sense trouble in your cul-de-sac, in your home, in your nation, on the world, he's waiting on you to invoke him, to call him, to invite him. You carry significant power because you operate in the name of Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador. You're God's child. You're God's ambassador. And you're God's priest or God's priestess. You're a part of the royal priesthood. This is why God hears your prayers. You're a member of his priesthood. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The job of the priest is to intercede for the people before the mercy seat of God. Your job is to intercede for your people. To do what Abraham did, to stand between God and the people who need mercy and say, Lord, help us. That's your job. You're a priest. Will God hear you? Absolutely he will. Not because of who, you know, anything you know, not because of your eloquence or accomplishment, but because you're there at his invitation in the name of Jesus Christ. You even have a seat in the heavens. The scripture says, you are are seated with Christ in the heavens. Now, you may not have a seat on the Supreme Court. You may not have a seat in Congress. You may not even have a seat on the school board. But listen, you have a seat with Christ in the heavens. That means you have a position of authority. You work in authority. And when you speak, heaven listens. When you request, heaven responds. When you operate, heaven declares that we need to act. Just like a congressman, you represent a district. You have been divinely assigned some people. Who are those people? Could be your neighborhood. Certainly your family. Could be people at work. These are people groups for whom you have a special burden. They may be another country. May be another society. Could be a specific population group somewhere in the world. But if you feel a burden for them, then you have been assigned this group. And your job as an ambassador, as a priest, as a child of God, is to continue bringing these people into the presence of God in prayer. In prayer. Because you are seated with Christ in the heavens. You are the Abraham of your cul-de-sac. You are the Moses of your family. Your privilege, your privilege 
is to speak to God on behalf of others. And when you speak, God hears. God hears. The church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is not peripheral to the world. In other words, we are not controlled by what the world does. The world is influenced by what the church does. You, if you're in Christ, are the body of Christ, called to be Jesus in your neighborhood, in your workplace. That means then that God issues his appeals through you as the priest, as the ambassador, as his child. And so you are a part of the command center of the world. That as God begins unveiling his plan, he engages his children to do so. Now, why would God do this? How curious of God to involve us in the decision-making outplay of his strategy. Why would God do this? Well, because he's preparing us for eternity. Remember, this life from birth to hearse is on the job training for heaven. Welcome to boot camp. This is it. You are being equipped in this life for the next life. And if you don't get that, life doesn't make much sense. But if you understand that everything in this life is preparing us for the next life, then you say, okay, God is training me. He's equipping me. And Scripture says over and over, we will reign with him. Why? Because we're a part of the family. And what's the family business? Running the universe. So we're going to have some role, some assignment. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Over and over, God gives us these promises that when we enter into our eternal home, we will have some responsibility with him to reign with him forever and ever. So everything in life is teaching us about Jesus Christ, our King, teaching us how we will work with Him, how He communicates, what His passions are, what His priorities are. One of the ways He teaches us, maybe the main way He teaches us is through prayer because we bring requests to Him. We appeal to Him. And we note when he says yes and when he says no. And even when he says no, we come to say, oh, even that was a yes because everything works out good. And it's just this communion, this dialogue, this interaction that we have with Jesus on a day-to-day basis that is preparing us for the day that someday we'll take on responsibilities for eternity. That's why your prayers matter because prayer is, is part of the exercise routine in developing our spiritual muscles but this much we know when God's people pray God listens we've seen this here at the church many times over and over I remember when I first came to the church back in the late 80s I was given an opportunity a couple of years after I'd been here to go speak at a really happy successful church in San Diego John Maxwell was the pastor at the time And I went out and I spoke at the church and I went out and I had lunch with John and I said, John, what's the secret? What's the key? What what, what does the church need? In your years of experience, what is the one thing you've learned that every church needs? And he gave me a really great idea. He said, go back to San Antonio and recruit prayer partners, people who will commit to pray every day for you and your family in the church. Recruit 120 because there were 120 disciples in the upper room. I thought that was symbolic. So we went back And I did. I recruited 120 people. As I was preparing these series of lessons on prayer, I came across a report that I sent to John Maxwell six months later, thanking him for the advice. I said, in the last six months, we have broken our Sunday attendance record twice. We have finished the year with our highest ever average Sunday attendance. We have finished the year over budget Yeah, over budget. We doubled our staff and elders. We witnessed several significant healings. And I said, church antagonism is at an all-time low and church unity is at an all-time high. (laughs) I was stunned. And the only thing we did different was pray. We didn't change anything else. We just prayed. As a church, we have seen the power of prayer. And as a church, we are seeing the power of prayer right now. 
Just two weeks ago, I sat in on a leadership meeting in which we heard glowing reports from all different fronts of our congregation. Every single campus is experiencing unprecedented growth. Every single campus. We're having more volunteers for every ministry than we've ever had. Our church, once again, is well over budget. And maybe most, well, certainly most importantly, most, more people are coming to Christ than ever before. We've had nearly 300 baptisms, and it's only, what, April? So far this year. We've never seen such a harvest. And so we started bannering around, what's going so well that's causing this to happen? <laughs> I think there are a lot of reasons. I think Randy Frazee is a great senior minister. I think he's brilliant. And I believe that the neighborhood plan is taking effect and we're learning to reach into our neighborhoods. I think we have wonderful elders. I think we have phenomenal members and ministers. But there's one reason that I think is most important. Where has our focus been over the last three months? Anyone? Prayer. Duh. Duh. We have been challenging each other to pray more, right? When we pray more, what happens? God hears. God acts. It is God's will to do good with his people, to teach us and to reveal his heart. And so as we pray, God responds. So my exhortation to you today, dear child and dear member of the Oak Hills Church or visitor of the Oak Hills Church, simply this, pray, pray, pray. Some of you are at the end of your rope. You keep praying. Some of you feel like you're out of energy. You just keep praying. Some of you think the world is going over the cliff in a bucket. Don't despair. Pray. Pray. In the name of Jesus, I call you to be and to walk in the authority that Jesus has given to you as a child of God, as an ambassador of God, as a priest or priestess of God. In the name of Jesus, we speak against all these spirits of doubt and fear and discouragement that seem to pull us down and try to convince us that we don't have any influence. There's nothing we can do. Enough of that hogwash in the name of Jesus. Just state it out. Operate in your authority as a child of God. Listen, you are, as a child of God, the salt in the society of our city. You are, as a child of God, the light in the society of our city. And if you aren't salty, there is no salt. If you aren't the light, if you put a bushel over your light, there is no light. So be the salt, be the light, pray, operate, walk in the authority that Jesus has given to you. You say, well, Max... Abraham could pray that way because he was Abraham. And Moses could pray that way because he was Moses. I disagree. I think Abraham became Abraham by praying that way. Moses became Moses by praying that way. And you're going to enter into your most fruitful season. We as a church and you as an individual. As we continue to pray, to pray, to pray because God hears our prayers because we matter to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you would hear our prayers. Again, not because we're worthy, but because you've called us to talk to you. Grant that, Lord, we may hear what you're teaching us as you prepare us for our eternal assignment. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the kindness that you have bestowed upon this church. We quickly confess that any good thing done here is because you've done it, not because we have. You are holy, you are righteous, you are faithful, you are strong. We announce that we must have you. We must have your presence. And thank you, Lord, that you will give it. Through Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.